Yeah, kia ora tato. Uh, thank you for that warm welcome. Um, I acknowledge um, uh, Fano from uh, Te Rafati, who are here today as well. There's several of us sit there. Thank you. I live in the Eastern Bay of Islands um, at, uh, near Te Rafati. Um, most of my research is around environmental history, uh, marine vi environmental history of the Bay of Islands. So, um, what's happened here? Okay, yeah, so I, um, it was suggested that I talk about uh, aspects of voyaging within Aotearoa with particular focus on the dispersal of obsidian in the north. Um, I accordingly have done, undertaken a literature review um, of the import and export of resources for uh, Tai Tokoro. And so the results that I'm giving here now are really indicative only. Um, I wanted to, uh, as much as anything, crystallise my own thinking about the import and the export of resources um, and so contribute to the kaupapa of, um, of this hui and to add to some of the um, regional studies undertaken by people like Janet Davidson, uh, Marianne Turner and others. I've got to remember to go over here, the machine doesn't work. Um, so a, a, a literature study. It's based, um, okay, it's based on substantiated finds, in other words, scientific evidence. Um, necessarily, it's to do with straight line movements rather than the serendipity associated with real travel, because we have no, really no, no way of knowing about that. It's also important to note that there are variable um, identification standards. Whereas for obsidian, um, where X-ray fluorescence has been used, Certainly recently, that is a very sure way of determining provenance of obsidian sources. But those same, um, the, the, the same structure, stricture has not been applied necessarily to some of the other lithics, which is a, a bit of a, 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 a down point. In, these, in, the, in this presentation, I'm going, going to be referring to early and late. Early refers to broadly pre-1500 um, and late refers to post-1500. I've got the term there boxed early and you'll see what that means in a moment. When I say, when a, when a map says it's early, it means that it was early and survived right through or imported, imported or exported, continued right through over time into the late pre-contact era. If it's a boxed early, it means that it was something that arrived and only arrived early and, didn't, and wasn't uh, reintroduced. And those are based on some of the sites that have been investigated and dates given in Taitokoro, with the boundary here, um, particularly Hohora, Tauroa Point, and Puirua in, uh, inland. And so in this corridor, a lot of it's to do with deciding whether people voyaged in order to get these resources between places, or whether they walked with them. So the structure of this presentation, I first of all deal with lithics, imports and exports, non-lithics, and then sum up after that. Um, th we've seen this before. I want to make this, emphasize the point that Alex made yesterday. Although this is an enormous distance, and those of you who are really onto it will have noticed that I've only got three and a half thousand kilometers here. Other people gave 4,000. That's all to do with plate tectonics. Uh, <laughs> But aside from that, once, <laughs> once, once, once they got here, these distances weren't small. If they were going from the top, where we are, to the bottom, that's close to a 4,000 kilometre return journey. So there's certainly nothing to be sniffed at. Uh, these are the imports. I'm, don't worry about that list on the left because I'm going to go through them in, in, a, in a wee bit of detail. And this shows the extent of um, lithic imports into Taitokoro. Um, and it shows the penetration, and you can see Punamu right to the top, Argelite right to the top, and then a, a series of obsidian and basalts right to the top. And if we look at the obsidian first, here's the case that I want to give. This is Mare Island obsidian. Mare Island obsidian was in the early period, pre-1500, but continued to be imported right through into late pre-contact times. These are all set up in a standard manner. 
that the source is a square box. Um, mostly it's point recoveries of, um, uh, of, of items, but where there was a much more general distribution, such as applies to Mare Island Obsidian, um, then there's a sort of a hat arrangement. And you can see the Mare Island Obsidian, very significant distances that they were uh, that transported from the source at Mare Island um, and during early and right through to late pre-contact times. Same with Cook Beach Hahe, uh, sometimes linked together as Coromandel here. Um, again, widespread, including on you know, ancient sites like Hohora. Um, Fennel Island, um, the same, um, but far fewer spots where Fennel Island obsidian has been recovered. When it comes to Great Barrier Island, just nearby, the obsidian from there is only in the late period. Um, yeah. For the other um, non-obsidian lithics, uh, the ones that are very noteworthy, first of all, is Nelson Marlborough Argillite uh, from uh, Derville Island in particular, but in that general area, a dark stone that took a, a fine grain and a high polish. Enormous distances that it was transported in order to get to Taitokoro. Um, at the same time, though, it was being distributed right to the end, to the bottom of the country. But you notice it's got a box around the early. This only happened in early times. It, the, they, <coughs> the obsidian um, was not imported in later times. And Tahanga Basalt here, just inside, inshore from Ahu Ahu, is the same. Very large distances, but only in the early period, and here's what it looked like. Punamu is different. Enormous distances, up to a thousand kilometres. Um, and it was from both early right through into late pre-contact times. And then there was the Motutapu Grey Wacky from just off Auckland, widely distributed in Northland, but it was only in the late period. What about exports, exports from uh, Taitokoro? Well, we've got some. Um, and you can see that, again, there's some uh, huge, huge distances involved. Let's have a look at them individually. First of all, Huruiki, Huruiki Obsidian, which is um, just down the road here, <coughs> Helena Bay. Um, widely dispersed throughout Northland, except I couldn't find a reference to any uh, recoveries um, along this bit of coastline here. And we do have, interestingly, at Palliser, records significant numbers of piece, uh, pieces of uh, Huruiki obsidian. However, I have to uh, say that from my understanding, I'm sure that the, uh, the number of the uh, lithics people in this room will put me right about this, that that was an early X-ray fluorescent determination. And uh, I think at the moment it's actually under question. Um, I suspect that too that there'll be a lot of other sites that I have simply not encountered yet in the literature um, particularly from archaeological reports from uh, professional archaeologists who produce an, a, a lot of the very good information um, about uh, archaeological information about lithics. Um, these are much more short. This is Punari. People have been referring it to Kayo, but I think it's a good justification for, for actually referring it to as Punari. Um, from here, just inland from where we are, uh, distances up to uh, 1,100 kilometres. Um, and those, I think, are secure, um, securely provenanced. And Northern Gabbro, it's a, it's a funny name, isn't it? Um, it it's a stone, I think, it's basalt-like. Um, the father of Gabbro is, um, is Dr. Uh, Ian Best there, uh, Dr. Simon Best there, um, who showed us that uh, Gabbro has been exported from, this, from its source area here, in, in, inland from where we are. Um, down as far east as Eastern Bay of Plenty. John, I wonder if um, Palliser no. Bay, after you know no, yeah, yeah, sorry, you can, we'll, we'll do it later. Okay. Um, so, if I was to, generally speaking, um, obviously there was some voyaging was unavoidable, because that in order to get from Mare Island, I mean, you weren't going to swim with carrying a hunk of, uh, of obsidian. Um, also, walker transport would have been essential if the objects were large or heavy, and particularly when populations were sparse. And so I conclude that in early times, it was mostly walker transport, waka haurua. 
the big double sailing ones where you could have a decent sized crew, you could have 24 hour watch, you could have, you didn't need to go ashore, you remained at sea, you got, you traveled, even though, even though you were traveling slowly, you got across big, big distances. Um, and it was later on that there may have been, may have been direct procurement via single hold walker, still with a sail, um, but not with the same sea holding capability. And I think the thing that needs to be emphasized throughout is, um, it, th it needs to be emphasized is that throughout, it was just as much social connection and transfer of ideas and concepts as it was about acquisition. Okay, so what other things other than lithics would have been tra uh, transported? I mean, I think if you turned up at Derville and wanted some argillite, I think it would be a very good idea to have something on board that you might swap. And particularly if it was something that wasn't available uh, to the people on Derville Island. I'm, probably, I'm being very simplistic there, but you get the gist. Um, I mean, you could have aboard stuff that was widely available, such as cured birds, cured kiori, cured kuri, uh, fish and so on. But what about specialist items from Taitokoro? Um, we can only be sure about those at the moment if they leave some sort of lasting signature, such, such as a shell or a bone. But in paraphrasing Roger Green, I think that there's no, uh, there's no great issue, no harm in speculating. The first one concerns Tohara. Last year in Nature magazine was this interesting paper published by Philip Ross and colleagues, historical translocations by Māori may explain the distribution and genetic structure of a threatened surf clam. When I talked to James Eduera about this, the ch chap who, who, I don't know whether James is here again today, he said, I know all about this. He's from up north. He knew that in early times, tohara were transported. They could keep them alive on the vessels very, very easily, um, just simply in kete, with, with a, which are sloshed with water. The thing about tohara is they have an extraordinary distribution. They're mainly in the far north on the west coast, but there's a significant population in the northwest uh, Nelson beaches and ar around Fovo Strait and a whole lot of little spots in between. The thing is, the, the genetics of these populations here are indistinguishable from the northern ones and that just does not make connectivity sense in a contemporary way for a thing that only has a three-week larval life. And furthermore, um, you could say, oh, well, they all came from here and went north. Well, possibly, um, except that this is the only part of the country where you get these, and people will have seen them, in this room will have seen them, these very large subfossil fossil shells. They're not ancient, they're maybe a thousand years old, um, or some hundreds, um, but they only occur in the northern zone, which means that that is the home of Tauro. And although you can't rely on this too much, perhaps because of sample size, at Tom Bowling Bay, <coughs> fairly recently, three artifacts were found. Um, here's one of them here. This is the other one here, which is a, bla a, a work blank. And the third one was a th between these two. Um, and this is the, uh, from a fishing lure, and it's made of subfossil fossil shell. Um, now, uh, interestingly, there is a piece of almost certainly sub-fossil uh, sub, uh, shell found at Wairo Bar in the excavations. And it brings us back to, um, uh, I think it was Richard's presentation, about Pinktada, the pearl oyster. When the early Polynesians arrived here, they would have searched high and low for a shell that had the same sort of characteristics for generation of fish hooks and so on as Pinktada, this thing here. And our, the hypothesis in this published paper is that there was a temporary uh, attempt to use the, the Toro shell as, a, as an alternative. But we conclude that it never really cut the mustard because it never uh, survived. And so Māori ended up using the two other best alternatives, which were large Haliotis iris, the big, you know, the big uh, um, black-footed pawa, um, and Cook's turban shell. Um, they were the ones that finally uh, survived. Um, 
what else would, might you have had in your, had a board with you? If I was going down to Derville from up here and I knew about all my uh, uh, relatives being so keen about the taro, I would have had heaps of taro on board. Um, but they won't leave much of a signature, at least not with modern, uh, modern technology. I would have Oti. Oti grew out here. I mean, they, uh, you know, um, Cook and company saw them um, still growing there, although being unused at that point, I think. Um, but Oti, uh, and it's, it's the bark that's used for making uh, tapa cloth. They may well have had pupu harakeke and pupu rangi as well. Those shells, though, may last, but we need to look out for it. We should have an open mind about it. If those shells, I mean, the advantage of those, you can keep them alive for quite long periods on board the vessel. They might have had certain warm water fishes, in this case, you know, dry, cured fish, particularly things like marlin, which we know were hand-lined um, in quantity along the east coast here. Um, they, I mean, think a bit more. Um, instead of having cages full of chooks, they may have had cages full of small mower. Um, and as Bill Edwards said, if you put one of those in the water, it would become a motor mower. <laughs> um, and I mean, any, I think if you went to any dock in, in Polynesia today and looked about the stuff that was sit, sitting there uh, waiting to be distributed, those vessels may well have had those. And I think that um, it would be not, in some ways, it's a danger of becoming too focused on the lithics and not focused enough on other uh, resources that were imported and exported. I think I've almost finished. So, concluding. So, work in progress based on literature, um, and it's only some of the literature, uh, but certainly, certainly I think some things are clear. Um, the lithics are much better understood than the non lithics. Some voyaging was unavoidable, such as for the Mare Island Obsidian. Um, Alongshore voyages uh, would have been more likely in early times using really substantial seagoing walker. Um, that could stay and hold station at sea. Enormous distances, uh, return journeys similar in extent to Hawaii. At the same time having, sorry, similar in extent to the ones to and from Hawaii. Um, at the same time having to remain close to land, which at times would be an advantage, but at times, as we read in the European accounts, a damn nuisance when, it's, when you're on the west coast and it's a westerly wind. And I think the important thing of all, most important of all, as noteworthy as anything else in the world at the time. Kia ora. <laughs>